Over a cuppa with Dilhan Fernando. Good morning, everyone. My guest on Over a Cuppa today is Professor Devaka Virakon, Professor of Zoology at the University of Colombo. More than that, he is a passionate and learned scientist who loves the environment and has a very practical perspective on forests. Devaka, good morning and welcome to Over a Cuppa. Good morning, Dilhan. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning. Devaka, I have a, a question for you. The world is talking about uh, forests and how important they are. And so most people see trees, but I would like to ask you, is a forest more than just the trees that it comprises? Uh, okay, give me a second to share my screen with you, Dylan. I would like to show some photographs. Uh, so basically uh, what you see in this map is the forest cover of the world. Um, forests cover roughly about 30% of the Earth's land surface, uh, and it also supports a large number of uh, living organisms, uh, nearly more than 75% of living organisms on land uh, are forest dwellers of one way or the other. But to get back to your question, uh, what is a forest? Is it just a bunch of trees or is there more to it? So basically what I'm showing you here uh, are three potentially different uh, vegetation types. Uh, what you see uh, first is, is a grassland, which is a very short vegetation type, which, which may vary from few inches to several feet. And then in the middle here, uh, you can see a plantation, uh, which is mostly a monocrop, uh, could be a rubber plantation or a teak plantation or eucalyptus where you can see the, the structure is very uniform. You have the tree canopy, the tree trunks and then few uh, shrubs on the ground here. And on the very corner here you can see the, the forest and uh, the first thing you would notice is that it is very complex. It has multiple layers and if I may take a more detailed photograph, what you see here is a cross section of a rainforest where you can see that there are a number of layers like these uh, trees that are coming uh, jutting out of the forest uh, canopy which are called emergence then the trees that make up the canopy of the forest then you have a sub canopy understory and so on and so forth so what this creates is a very complex three-dimensional space and therefore it provides a number of different lifestyles there are things that live in the canopy things that live above the canopy things that live in the sub canopy there are things that are living in the tree trunks, in tree holes. There's a whole bunch of species that live in tree holes. And uh, so what this creates is a very complex three-dimensional space which provides various types of lifestyles, what we refer to in uh, technically as niches. Uh, so that means uh, 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 even uh, if you take a unit area of forest, it can support a much broader uh, assemblage of species compared to a plantation or a grassland or any agricultural field. So that is one answer to your question. Is it just a bunch of trees or does it transcend beyond a collection of trees? So one answer is yes, it's a very complex three-dimensional structure that provides a very uh, different lifestyles. Uh, and also I think what we have to now, I'm showing you here uh, some major forest types in Sri Lanka, which is again governed by climate. So Sri Lanka has three climatic zones, wet, intermediate and the dry. So if you go and look at a forest somewhere here in the lowland wet zone, it's a very complex rainforest, uh, very tall trees and it has the complex structure I just uh, explained uh, regarding the forest structure. Uh, this is because there is a lot of water, this type of forest requires uh, very heavy rainfall. But when you go up here to the mountain, 
plantains, you see the forest structure changes. The trees become gnarled, they become shorter because there is more wind on the top of the forest. And then if you just cross over to the dry zone, you will see the trees are now more spaced out. There is more uh, space between trees which allows bigger animals to roam like elephants, leopards, spotted deer. Uh, but when you go to a rainforest, uh, you get very few big animals, large animals. And then when you go to the coastal zone, you have things like mangrove forests which grows in waterlogged soil and therefore they have a unique set of attributes to survive in such an environment. So the second answer to your question, it's not just a bunch of trees, it's defined by the climate, the physical conditions, the forest will vary uh, and also the types of species that you have will also change with these conditions. And thirdly, if you look at a forest, one of the main functions it does is it traps water, it inter intercepts fog like if you go to Nuwarelia, this kind of scenery is very common. But uh, uh, even uh, in uh, further down, you can see the trees can trap water, rainwater, fog, and then the water slowly trickles down to the ground, and therefore the, the, the speed at which water hits the ground decreases, and therefore it reduces soil erosion, and then the forest flow absorbs the water and releases it slowly, so there is year-round flow in the streams. So then when you go into a forest, you not only see trees, you see this kind of streams which have very clear water and it supports again a different kinds of animals who live uh, primarily in water as well as animals who transiently associate with it. And the other thing I would like to point out is when you look at, now this is a photograph of a rainforest from Malaysia, uh, you can see how rich this habitat is so many trees within such a small area. So one would assume that this to maintain such a big biomass you need lots of nutrients. Now we know in our agricultural fields we use lots of nutrients to support the trees. But if you go to a forest like this and look at the soil, you find that the soil contains a very thin nutrient layer, very little organic matter because forests are very good at recycling the limited resources they have. So whenever a leaf falls on the ground, a twig falls on the ground or a tree falls on the ground, they are quickly recycled and reuse, utilize, so the resources are amply uh, recycled, therefore there is no dearth of nutrients. However, if you remove things from here, that affects the recycling. This is why we ask people not to remove uh, forest wood from the flow of, uh, as fuel wood and so on, because if you take something out of the forest, you take it away from this very efficient recycling system, creating a, a, a little imbalance. So that is why we would like forests to be left alone, so they can support itself without any additional support from us. And, and when we talk about the soil, there is another thing that I would like to mention here. Whenever a person walks to a forest, what they see is what is above ground. Uh, we don't see what is uh, at the ground layer or what is below ground. And uh, below the soil, that is the soil biodiversity or the below ground biodiversity is also very important in a forest. And uh, most of these are very small microscopic organisms, but they carry out very important work. They are the ones who recycle everything and they are the ones who support this incredibly rich assemblage of trees. So to give a long answer to your question, is it just a bunch of trees? No, it's a very complex system. Uh, it uh, has very complex structure, it provides a lot of lifestyles and it survives on its own because it is very very efficient in recycling the limited resources it has and it has created a massive biomass. So uh, I would look at forest as a very complex organism. That's incredible in terms of the sophistication but I then I suppose that we all know that uh, nature um, has a perfect work in, uh, in, in so much of what we see. But uh, uh, how, so when you look at this complex forest ecosystem, Devika, what is its, its relevance uh, 
uh, and function where uh, humans are concerned, where our uh, lives, uh, livelihoods, food, and uh, economic systems are concerned? Um, yes, uh, that's a very interesting question because I think uh, Forests are in incredibly important for people. Uh, there are certain people, like if you go to some of the South American forests, they live their entire life in the forest. Their whole life, their livelihoods, everything depends on it. So when we talk about uh, these forests, we, we use the term ecosystem services. That is to explain the different types of goods and services we derive from natural systems. Forest is a natural system. So uh, one of the things that we derive from forest uh, is food uh, or, or goods that we can directly use, uh, like food, various types of spices, medicine, timber, all these are things that we directly use. Touching material for roofs, if you look at some of the, we don't do that anymore because we have now replacements like asbestos and so on. But in the past, if you go uh, look around many of the, the houses uh, near forests, they are all built out of material collected from the forest. So it provides you shelter, it provides you food, it provides you medicine, it provides you a lot of things which are called provisioning services. Well, on, but I think one of the most important things that forests uh, do is they provide us fresh water, clean water and clean air because forests are able to trap uh, particles in the air, it's able to remove some of the carbon dioxide and it's also able to uh, cool down the entire area. When you go into a forest you immediately feel a coolness that you don't feel outside. So uh, these are uh, other things that it provides us. But there are a number of things that the forest provides us that we do not really take into account because uh, the, some of the services that the forest do, they do it very silently. We only understand it when the service is not there. So uh, these are some of the services th that I would like to point out some critical services like uh, supporting pollinators because our whole uh, food security depends on food that we produce. So when you take agriculture, one of the most important things that control the yields of agri agricultural produce is pollination. So most of the pollinators live in the forest like wasps, bees, a number of other small insects, uh, birds. So they are uh, uh, forest dwellers who come out of forests, pollinate our agricultural fields and helps us to maintain yields. So that not only uh, support our food security, it also support the farmers, their livelihoods and so on. For Then the forest dwellers also help uh, us to disperse seeds, uh, recycle things uh, and also uh, since the forest is able to uh, absorb rainwater and slowly release it, it prevents droughts as well as floods. These are two of the most critical things that we face uh, because I think especially uh, you know city, city dwellers like us, uh, floods are a big issue but if you are a farmer both droughts and floods uh, are not good for agricultural practice. So these kinds of supporting services are also very important. And then the forest regulate lots of things. It regulates the cycling of water. Without water, life itself is not possible on this planet. But forests are the ones that help us to keep water cycling. It also traps material in the water, it removes toxic material, so it purifies water and this is another very important function because it removes uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Today I think one of the most critical problems we are facing is this climate change related issues which are driven by greenhouse gases, fundamentally CO2. So forests are able to remove CO2 and sequester them in their biomass and and therefore it helps us to, it is our first line of defense against climate change. And finally, uh, the, the forest also gives us these kinds of services, uh, spiritual renewal, 
opportunity for recreation which can of course convert it to uh, industry the whole ecotourism industry and then also a lot of uh, people have certain spiritual connectivity like in, in Sri Lanka uh, you have all three religions going to peak wilderness peak wilderness or Samana Ladavia is not only for Buddhists the, the Christians uh, go there, the Muslims go there. So it allows religious harmony, harmony among people. And also for us are incredibly rich laboratories where we use uh, these laboratories to train people and we go there and try to understand this complex system which itself is very invigorating. So uh, to answer your question, what is the value of forest to us? Uh, the forest are the values are immeasurable um, and, and I know some people have tried to there is a whole discipline called uh, environment economics where we try to put values to forests but when you look at the complex services they provide I do not know whether even we can start begin to start uh, to fathom the total value of a forest so they are incredibly valuable resources for human beings and all the other living organisms that we share this planet with. So Devika, what uh, you have very compellingly presented is that forests are uh, not only life-sustaining, but actually critical for our survival um, from uh, pollination and food security aspect, from uh, cultural aspect, uh, uh, in terms of our uh, uh, senses and our uh, uh, well-being, uh, but uh, also in terms of uh, the ecosystem services or the critical life support systems that it uh, presents. So if we were to venture to do, to do what you mentioned, uh, uh, talking about uh, the, the economic aspect, if we were to venture a guess, would there be some sort of benchmark on how within our conventional economic system we might value a forest? Um, actually, um, I would like to uh, remind you uh, or, or share with you this experiment, incredibly massive experiment that uh, humans did a few years back. It's called Biosphere 2, where they try to create ecology. So they, they created a closed space. Uh, they they uh, put uh, they, they've created various types of ecosystem and it's a closed system they try to keep it a self-sustaining system and they uh, put eight people into this and these eight people lived in this system for two years uh, completely depending on what is provided by the system so uh, this this was actually a prelude i think to see whether we can go and uh, colonize inhospitable places like pl like planets like planet mars and so on but the first uh, uh, cycle was successful uh, then the first eight biospherians came out the second set went in within few months the whole system began to collapse so having spent millions of dollars to try to create ecology what we found out that what we created was only good for few years but if you try to extend uh, the, 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 this into the services that are provided by natural systems I think the estimates are tremendous they're like running to several trillion dollars annually uh, because uh, these services that we receive free of charge, uh, if you try to quantify them, what is the service uh, or what, what can you... Now, if you take the city of Colombo, uh, the, the wetlands, they, uh, they help us to prevent floods. Now, if you take the 2016 flood, uh, the, the damage was estimated to be around $1.6 billion. So if you re lose the wetlands, that is the service you are losing. So using that kind of argument, the Colombo wetlands are valued, valued at 16 billion rupees annually. But uh, do we really feel that? Uh, I mean, if you convert these wetlands into land, maybe you can get a few million rupees per perch, but that would be the end of that service. This is an argument that we, we, are, we, we try to forward and try to convince people that these things are very important therefore we have to handle them carefully natural systems should not be converted unless it is absolutely essential uh, 
for for human development uh, but i i find that a uh, lot of these uh, natural ecosystems are converted in a very unsustainable manner for human settlements or agriculture which is one of the hu uh, the major challenges we face today in the world to convince planners that we have to pay more attention when we come up with development projects because these ecosystems are very important services we receive are very valuable and therefore uh, we have to be very careful when we uh, handle these uh, natural ecosystems especially for us i guess it's uh, it's 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 about value as you said and uh, possibly uh, the issue is well not possibly but i think definitely the issue has to be i mean for me as a as a business person um, the issue has to be that uh, our very conventional and increasingly outdated economic system fails to recognize these uh, so called free goods but uh, it's a little like trying to see with your eyes shut to uh, uh, you know to, to to try to appreciate these things and i really hope this concept of value and i saw some beautiful work done on the great barrier reef and uh, we can only hope that uh, our community our policy makers uh, have the good sense to to see and appreciate uh, what uh, uh, we might be risking and on the subject of risking so many forests around the world from that incredible uh, amazon forest to uh, forest in sri lanka are under threat why do you think this is devaka um i i think uh this is basically what we are talking about we are converting much of the natural uh, forests natural ecosystems into agricultural land uh, there are 7.2 billion people in the planet and the estimates are that we will be reaching 9 billion soon which means 9 billion mouths to feed uh, so we have to produce food uh but on the other hand what i would like to point out is uh, what we have in this world is not a, a lack of foods there is unequal distribution of food and also uh we don't uh, we have a lot of uh, post harvest losses in in sri lanka itself we lose about 50% of uh, what we harvest between farm to mouth which means you have to produce double the amount of food in order to meet the required demand uh, and when you double your food production that means you have to convert double the amount of land from natural systems to agricultural land so this is uh, th these are some of the issues i think we have to look at uh, what you see here is a map of the world where you can see the brown areas are areas that we have converted into agriculture land so roughly about 25% of the earth surface is converted to agriculture land but what is more uh, uh, what concerns me uh, is, is this issue because you you can see two maps here the one on the top shows uh, the areas that we have converted uh, into agriculture one below is uh, a map showing the biodiversity hotspots of the world there are 36 biodiversity hotspots sri lanka is also one and these red areas that are marked in this map support 60% of this world's living organisms and you can see that this conversion is also taking place in this very very rich biodiverse areas which has caused lot of these species to become threatened so this is the issue that we are facing what you see here is the current uh, trends in forest all this red area show that the forest cover is going down we can see only few areas like europe Uh, and, and some parts of china and russia where there is some uh, improvement in forest cover but rest of the world especially this tropical belt uh, what you see here is the amazon the incredibly rich amazon congos the malaysian rainforest these are uh, in in indonesia we are losing forest cover very rapidly so more than uh, the current estimates are like 13 million hectares of natural forests are lost each year that's like about 1/5 the size of sri lanka annually in sri lanka we lose about 7000 hectares 
um, that's about one third of Singharaja annually. All of this for development. Uh, and when you lose forest, it's not only forest that we lose, we lose large number of living species because some species can live only in the forest and I, sh I showed at the beginning that forests support large number of animals and plants. So when we lose forests we also lose species and what is most uh, disturbing is that forest uh, destruction contributes about 20 percent of the greenhouse gases. So this exacerbates an you know, already challenging problem we are facing which is climate change driven by greenhouse gases so uh, what we are doing is we take forest which stores carbon which removes carbon from the air and we release the carbon back into the atmosphere we are doubling the problem uh, of climate change by doing this so i would like to share with you this this is a satellite image uh, taken in 2019 and all these red areas indicate forest fires in the great Amazonian basin uh, and and the amount of uh, forest loss is massive in 2019 alone and this was not only restricted to 2019 the subsequent year 2020 we had similar forest fires years before we had similar forest fires I just chose this just to show the magnitude of the problem that we are dealing with and this is only in in uh, South America we had the similar situation in Australia the same year uh, Australian uh, wildfires resulted in massive loss of natural forest cover so this uh, uh, if you look at the Amazon, Amazonian, uh, these forest fires are driven by uh, slash and burn farmers. They're, they're burning uh, the forest, cutting and burning the forest for agriculture. So uh, if you look at Sri Lanka, uh, you can. I'm just showing you these two maps side by side. This map shows the, the, the coverage of uh, man-made tanks. And you can see the entire dry zone. Uh, contains large number of man-made tanks. These tanks were produced for agriculture uh, to support agriculture and what you see here is the forest cover in the dry zone and when you compare these two you can see that most of these areas the forest would have been removed for agriculture during the hydraulic civilization that lasted uh, from about 500 BC to 1200 AD and then the civilization shifted to the wet zone allowing these forests to recover. So if you look at most of the dry zone forests these have been remodeled during the last 2500 years. We see the results of it if you go to this forest you don't see very few endemic species uh, because when you remove a forest uh, the endemic species or species that have evolved in this forest are the ones that are most sensitive to this deforestation. So you lose them. And you can see here the hydraulic civilization fell, the forest recovered, but what we lost can never come back. Extinction is forever. So that is why we see that the, the uh, in the dry zone forest, uh, endemic species that are restricted to dry zone are very few. You only find them in these kind of incel bergs or mountains that are jutting out of the dry zone. So uh, I think uh, what I'm showing you here uh, is uh, the Geelong Mountains or the Maragala Mountains in the Monragala district. There are lots of these kind of isolated mountains that you see across uh, dry zone like Ritigala, Kokagala and so on and when we go to these mountains we see there are lots of endemic species here which s sort of gives us an indication as to what we may have had and what we, we may have lost uh, due to uh, deforestation in the dry zone. Now the deforestation continues. This is what uh, these three uh, frames uh, show you what has happened to our forest since independence. So this is 1956, just after independence, we started reclaiming the dry zone with large uh, irrigation projects. First things like uh, uh, Galloya project, uh, then uh, in Udawalawa and so on. Then subsequently the Mahavali development program which has resulted in large-scale conversion of forest into agriculture land and human settlements. 
Now, what have we lost with all this? I think we have lost many things. We lose pollinators, as I've indicated earlier. Uh, forests are very important for po pollinators. Uh, we see a global decline in pollinators, which is very concerned. People are very concerned about it because without pollinators, our agricultural productivity goes down, which means we have to uh, produce more and more, which means we'll have to convert more and more forests. So we get trapped in this very vicious cycle. You destroy more forests to grow, but your yields come down. So uh, there is a never ending thing, which will push us deeper and deeper into a uh, uh, a crisis. Then we lose seed dispersal agents. We we lose natural predators because the, the species that live in forests come out and feed on lots of insects that are potentially pests on our, our agricultural lands. There are things like birds, bats, spiders, small and medium sized carnivores. Now today we have a huge problem with peacocks. Uh, and their population is growing without control. One of the reasons we believe is loss of small predators like jackals. Like when I was uh, very young, I grew up very close to Colombo in Bellangvilla. We had jackals in Bellangvilla, not anymore. They have just disappeared because we have changed, the urbanization has removed them. So when you remove predators like jackals, it results in uh, some of the species that are kept under control by these predators starts expanding and some of them have reached pest situations in the country. We lose soil biodiversity and we also, this uh, forest function as barriers preventing large-scale uh, or, or uh, movement of pathogens and pests in, in, in a larger landscape. So when you remove the forest, these barrier effects are gone. But I think one of the things that really concerns us today is the human-wildlife conflict. Not a day goes by without us hearing something about human-elephant conflict, but we're not only in conflict with elephants, we're in conflict with wild boars, we are in conflict with peacocks, uh, crocodiles, uh, large, the, 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 the list keeps growing. And if you compare the number of conflicts that are growing with what is happening to forests, you see there is the re on one side we have reduction of forests and on the other side we have escalation of conflict. So these things go hand in hand. And conflict obviously has a huge impact on agriculture because most of the farmers are heavily influenced by conflict or, or we cannot uh, get the benefits uh, of agriculture due to conflict and we spend millions of rupees for agricultural development but we don't get the desired results because of the conflict that occurs and uh, forests are extremely important for water cycling and water is extremely important for agriculture. So once again, by converting forests to agriculture, we have compromised the water security and therefore ability to do uh, agriculture. So this is basically uh, what we are losing, uh, or this is the impact of uh, removal of forest without a sustainable plan, at least in my mind. Um, argument, uh, Devaka, for any person, whether you're a businessman, uh, individual, or a policymaker. But um, I think the importance uh, of, of what we uh, should should focus on now is, is to ensure that there is awareness. And hopefully with awareness, there will become the commitment. And uh, in that way, we can try to induce change. But tell me, to add to this very compelling argument that you have shared, what would life be without forests, theoretically, hopefully? Okay, I, I can only uh, imply what it would be based on what we know of evolutionary history. Uh, now what you see here is planet Earth, which is unique because as far as we know, this is the only planet that can support life or that supports life at present. Now, this is a very old planet. It's four and a half billion years old. And for nearly three and a half billion years, it was a planet that is that has oceans but the land would have looked something like this it was a blue planet the land was not colonized by trees so it's very desolate very brown the soil is exposed so uh, only about a billion years ago 
plants started slowly uh, uh, colonizing the land and then they start producing forests and then they converted the land into a green uh, cover. So what we see today uh, is if, if you go back one billion years this is what the world would have looked like. But today we have a, a planet where about 30% of the land is covered with forest and there's a lot of other vegetation types on the planet which is now a blue-green planet. Now what would life be without forest? This is what life would be to me without forest. It's desolate, it's dry, it will not be able to support agriculture, so we'll have issues with food, we will have huge problems with water, and uh, I think uh, even I've seen a number of uh, uh, books written, publications written about the future wars will be fought not for anything else but for water, over water rights. We already see some of these conflicts arising in the world. So it is going to be a very uh, uh, undesirable world where we will have many challenges with me, uh, meeting the food requirements, the water requirements and at the same time because the resource, when the resources get limited and the population increases the inevitable outcome is war and we all know war is not very desirable uh, because it, it only speeds up destruction because it's a very destructive process. So I think this is what lies ahead of us if we do not uh, take care of our natural ecosystems. But I think, I always like to think positively, I think we have not lost the war. I think we still have a lot of time to correct our problems and, and uh, address our issues and go forward if we do care about these natural systems and understand how important they are for our existence and what the world would be without them. So to answer your question, can I think of a world without forests? Yes, I can, but this is what comes to my mind, uh, this kind of world, which is not a very desirable place to live uh, or to bring up our next generations. Uh, Devaka, that's a pretty compelling argument. Um, you know, this uh, uh, clearly um, your reference to care. We have to care because it's a question of the survival of our of our generations, and whether or not uh, we care about our children and their children. Uh, I think there's a strong moral argument. There's a commercial argument. There's a social argument. There's an economic argument. Really, whichever way you look at it, it's it's very compelling. But I guess. Um, I'm so happy to, to hear that you're positive about it, and I absolutely share that uh, optimism. Uh, but uh, I guess the change that we, we need to see to move the needle on this matter, it needs to start with each of us. So I guess my final question to you is, what could each of us do? I mean, if I were to tell my children, look, this is a problem, and this is something you could do to help, uh, what would it be? Um, I think we can uh, engage this problem in, in multiple ways. Like you said, I think uh, first we should start ch bring change within ourselves. Uh, we can start uh, changing how we utilize resources because uh, even if I save uh, water, if I save energy, because now if you say uh, to produce the energy that we use, you either have to have reservoirs, which means converting forest uh, into reservoirs, or if you're going for solar, that means you still have to clear vegetation to establish a solar farm. If you want to put a wind farm, again the same problem. So if we can reduce our footprint uh, in terms of energy, in terms of water, that means the generation can be can go down. If one person starts, if all of us tries it, if 7.2 billion people try to do this on a daily basis, I think uh, we will have to produce less, which means we can reduce the conversion. And also sharing things. Uh, I think one of, I, I pointed out earlier, the issue we are facing is not lack of food, it's poor distribution of food. Uh, so I, I think uh, 
we should ne- we shouldn't try to overutilize things we must try to i mean these are things that we were taught in the kindergarten i once read a book which says all what you had to learn they taught us in the kindergarten to be nice to people to share with people to return things back to where they are not to use more than what we need so i think these are uh, th- it's easy to say very difficult to practice uh, i think all of us might forget this from time to time but i think we have to constantly remind ourselves that our footprint on this planet is tremendous i mean if you look at some of the things uh, you may have seen on tv uh, during the covid shutdown how the atmosphere cleared how the water cleared in venice you could see the fish in the water which you cannot so th- this clearly shows the footprint of man on this planet which is tremendous so i think one of the things we can do as individuals is try to rethink what we are doing can we cut down the amount of emissions on a daily basis if it if it becomes part of our existence i think that that is something that we can start with and nobody ca- can say that it takes it's not a doable thing because it only takes a little effort on our part and then i think we should try to uh, educate others to try and do it because we are not asking them to do something bad uh, just use uh, we are not asking them not to do things we are just asking them to do things only uh, according to what we need but you can go beyond that uh you can uh, i think that's what you do as dilma conservation that's what i have been doing as a conservation biologist we try to uh go in a more organized manner bring people together uh, as associations as organizations as various kinds of uh, structural uh, constructs to uh, provide platforms for people to work together for conservation that is the second layer but i think the third layer is what we do as uh, now what i was telling first was what we do as human beings on our day to day life but all of us have a job to do i am a lecturer you are a businessman another person is a road engineer but in our work we have to make sure that environment is part of our formula because all these development projects all these things are uh, designed by educated people we always blame the politician but as educated people are we doing our thing right are we running our businesses in a sustainable manner or oh, as a, a lecturer am i uh, teaching my students the sustainable ways to do things or oh, as a engineer are you designing a sustainable project for the country so i think we can uh, do a lot of things by ourselves by doing the right thing but i think uh, sometimes people don't realize this I, i think when people do some of the things that we see as bad it's not because they are bad people but they have not come to realize this is the footprint we are having this is how we have to change our way that we need a paradigm shift in how we do things because the world has only limited resources and and uh, this is a beautiful world and it's worth saving uh, and, and i know some of the people are thinking about colonizing other planets and so on but that's a far cry uh, and, and it will only be available for only few rich people but this planet is here it's good it's still savable and if we work hard i think we can make this a very desirable planet not only for us but for generations to come that is how i feel about this and i think we can do it if we all put our minds together and make an effort i couldn't agree more devaka and i think even those very rich people who might go and colonize mars they may end up very unhappy because i think we are very much a part of the natural ecosystem i i can't imagine life if i had to wake up in the morning and not see a tree or hear bird song i've been hearing so much bird song in the background uh, while listening to you but i want to um before i i wrap up uh, if i can uh, if you will permit me to ask you one uh, final question um i saw a tweet the other day which i thought was quite interesting where it suggested that uh, whenever you eat fruit or, or vegetables or something with seeds in it that a simple act at a very simple level is that uh, you could take the seed you could dry it 
and you could simply throw it out into a forest area or somewhere where there's land. I mean, is that a, uh, I know very simple, but is that a suggestion that would be valid in your opinion, Devaka? Um, it depends because uh, I think some of the things we eat are exotic to this island. One of the issues we are facing today is this uh, issue of introduced species. Some of them have become invasive. So I think uh, introducing things into forests uh, by people uh, has to be done very carefully because if we try to uh, put seeds into forests which doesn't belong there naturally then we are again creating uh, uh, and, and some of these seeds uh, might be very invasive uh, maybe the seeds might grow up into trees that are very invasive and may very, very well change the composition of the forest but I, I think we, we, we can grow trees in our home garden uh, because uh, uh, forest afforestation or forest restoration these are highly technical things so we, I don't think people should meddle with it even though how uh, good they think the outcome will be unless they understand these complex systems but I think growing plants yes I would agree 100% uh, if you can use the seeds to grow in your home garden maybe in a pot even a small plant helps to remove CO2. So uh, I would uh, support anybody who tries to grow plants uh, even at a very small scale than people who are trying to cut plants because um, it, it, it's, uh, it's much better for this world even to have uh, an additional plant. Uh, but again, uh, where we grow plants, I think that's something that we have to uh, think a little carefully simply because of this issue of invasive species uh, which is shifting the balance in some natural ecosystems. Professor Deva Kavirakorn, it's been such an honor. You are an incredible advocate for life through your work in the environment and uh, I want to appreciate you on behalf of my family and uh, my colleagues at Dilma Conservation and Dilma. Um, what you're doing is incredibly important and uh, thank you because you have shared your knowledge in a, in a way that is easy to understand. And I hope that this uh, podcast will be a blessing on people who really want to do something, but uh, simply lack the direction, the guidance. You have truly provided that. Thank you, Devaka. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for spending uh, an hour with us. Thank you very much. An absolute much. pleasure to uh, be with you as always. Um, you are someone I appreciate very much and I appreciate the work you do. And most strength to you, Dilhan. Keep, the, keep up the good work. 